Hi, friends. It's nice to be at a conference. Sorry, I can't be there in person, but you know how things are. Hopefully next year, we'll keep our fingers crossed. Um, I'm glad you guys could be here today. I'm glad we could have this talk. Um, I'm excited to kind of share my journey on how I got to be a QA. Because we all have different paths, right? The, and, and they brought us to where we are today in our careers. And in some cases, like mine, those paths have been down rabbit holes and over yellow brick roads. They're winding and they end up where we never imagined we could be. But while those amazing journeys have led us here, in many a tester's case, including mine, the lessons we learned along the way have influenced how and what we test. So come with me on a journey and we'll go down the rabbit hole and we'll go across the yellow brick road and we'll talk about the lessons that, that I've learned along the way and how they color kind of what I test. Need to make sure I'm okay. I am. So I am Amanda Perkins. I am a senior software quality analyst with Rocket Homes. Um, super excited to be there. I started with them in September and it's been an amazing journey so far. So I look forward to every day that I wake up. Um, I've been a QA for about eight years, uh, but I have a background in a ton of things. The first time I went to college, it was for music education. I've done everything from customer service to academics, to retail sales, to just about anything you can think of. Um, eventually, I ended up on the IT side of things, and I have been here ever since. Uh, if you want to connect, I've got some um, options there for you, Gmail, Twitter. I will talk about just about anything, um, testing, IT, soft skills, um, kids, books, whatever sounds good. I, I'm always up for connecting. So we're going to start by following the white rabbit. And as a teenager, of course, we all have these little jobs, right? I was, I babysat. I was like a summer nanny type babysitter for a couple of years and I did these little off things um, but when I got older I ended up working for the local library and for that uh, movie store back when there were VHS tapes and the place where you went had a big blue ticket and yellow writing on it some of you might know what that one is some some maybe not but um, I learned some really interesting lessons about people that that helped me with testing even then, even when I wasn't testing before I knew it. Some of the things that I learned about people were um, that people just in general are kind of strange creatures. Um, they can come up and, and think about it. You go and you're looking for something in particular or you're just talking to someone and you're like, you know, it was, it was that movie and there was a guy in it and he was with that redheaded girl in a TV show and it was years ago. They can give the most vague descriptions of, of things, right? And, and they, they just kind of vaguely know what they want to do, or even on books. Um, it was always fun to try to use the Dewey Decimal System to find a book that someone couldn't figure out what it was. Um, but with a lot of practice and just kind of being there, you start to translate, you start to interpret what they're talking about. And, and when you get good enough, you actually do know what they're talking about. I ended up finding a strange horror movie one time in the movie store based on a few vague descriptions and a lot of like six degrees of separation, like this person was this, per this person. And so it just, it made me realize that people don't do what they expect you to do, you know, what you expect them to do. And they'll always do something a little out of the box, a little strange. And I'll, I'll kind of show where that, where that helps out in testing here in, in a minute. But something else I learned about people was when I was uh, working retail. And I did, I worked for the company that was black and white and had a sharp image. Um, they had a lot of strange toys and electronic goods. And what I learned there was something that they actually taught us in training was that the people will always say no the first time you ask them something. It's a knee-jerk reaction and they just do it, right? Um, think about the times that you go into a store and the salesperson comes up, greets you at the door. Hi, how are you? Is there anything you're looking for today? 
initial reaction usually is, no, no, I'm good, right? That's the first thing that we do when someone comes up and asks us. Well, in retail, we were taught that take that first note, but then be like, hey, in case you didn't know, here are some sales that are going on. Here's some things that are happening. Could I interest you in this? And you keep having these conversations and, and people will either answer yes or they'll answer no. When you're taught as a retail salesperson, three no's, you're just done. No more. No, don't ask them anymore. Let them go on about their business, and, but be there to help if they had, do have any questions. So what that showed me was that, and this, this goes for IT and for our applications as well, people will put up with a lot and a lot more than we give them credit for if they think that in the end, they're gonna get something that is good for them or something that they kind of realize, oh yeah, that would be helpful. But we will actually, as people, we kind of just put up with a great deal. Think, think about those times when the salesperson has been like that and, and think about how far you, you let it go. And now that I've kind of introduced you to this, think about that going forward. Think about how many times people come up and you have that interaction, right? Take that in with you when you're testing or when you're developing and you'll start to see that, oh, okay, our users will actually put up with this small bug if they think that in the end they're getting something out of our applications or our software that is useful and helpful for them. Something else, some other things I learned were along the way when I was a food and beverage coordinator at a golf course. And what I learned there was that you can be really, really good at something in practice, but when you put it into a practical application, you cannot be as great. And let me explain. So in the off season, if, I mean, most of you are probably from Omaha or this region, you know, Kansas City is kind of the same way. Um, in the winter, golf courses kind of shut down, right? There's snow, there's ice, you don't want to disturb the grass or anything. So in the off time um, to cut costs, we were low staffed. So I would work double duty at the uh, food and beverage area, and then I would work in the pro shop. And during the pro shop, not a lot going on. So you read magazines and you learn how to, I, I've never golfed before, so I learned how to swing, right? And on paper, and in pictures, if you put me in front of a mirror, I had a picture perfect swing. It was piece by piece by piece, the swing, the back swing, all the way through, it was great. Then everybody decided to try to put me on the course. And I hit that tee and I would either top it or I would smash into the grass every single time. It didn't matter how much practice I had done if I didn't put it to a practical application uh, it just, I just wasn't as good, right? And so we can look at that sometimes in the software that we're creating or testing. And, and we can say, you know, on paper, this design is really, really great. And I really think it's going to work. Um, but when we get down to it, when we start to develop it, when we start to do it, okay, well, maybe that, that route didn't work. So maybe let's go a different direction. Or when we're testing it, users aren't going to be able to find it because, you know, while we think it looks great this way, what happens when a user does this other thing? So on paper, we can always look really, really great. And we can be like, yes, that's awesome. But then we put it in front of a user acceptance test or we put it in front of our testers and we're just like, oh, well, maybe that doesn't work out. Or even in developing, maybe you thought this one route was gonna be the best way, but it really should go this other direction, right? Something else I learned about people, and this is, so I'm, I, I've been in the library, in the movie store, and I've been at uh, the, the golf course and, and eventually end up as a customer service rep for a couple of different things for a pharmacy and for an online university. And what I learned there is more of kind of a personal lesson that I took away, but something that we can also use when we look at our, our users, our customers, our, the people that we work with. And what I learned there is that change is hard. Change is really, really hard. And whether or not we want to do it, sometimes we have to in order to get better. Sometimes we have to take that, that change and we have to go, you know, I don't like it and it's not fun and it's really gonna upset my entire universe here, but uh, 
we're going to have to do it because that's what's going to make us better, right? That's what's going to make our applications better. If we just stay stagnant with what we're doing and we don't change, we'll never get any better at what we're doing, both personally and professionally. Um, there's there's a lot of things that we can do that, that makes it better. And, and just looking at change and realize, you know, sometimes we have to change our mindset. And that's the hardest thing to do at all, you know, overall is changing that mindset of, um, how can I make this better? How can I be better at my job? How can I do this and, and make this better as an application? And that was shown to me when I was at the, the university in a lot of ways, not just as our team is um, one of the things that we said was change is our constant. And we actually had t-shirts with the um, mathematical formula of entropy on the back. Um, <laughs> so it like change was always happening. Change is always happening. That's the thing about IT and where we are now is the fact that we're constantly going through some sort of evolution, some sort of change. And our applications have to do that too. We have to, to meet those, those pieces that change that are getting better. Um, in QA, automation was the big evolution. We had to change to meet um, automation, but now we're getting the uh, AI and we're getting into the point where we can use tools that look at a, sn a snapshot of what our web application looks like, and then we can compare it and find out where the bugs are, right? There's a constant evolution. And it's hard to get our minds wrapped around that sometimes. I know it is for me personally. There was tons of times, there have been a lot of times where I've just been like, ah, oh, I don't want to change. I'm so comfortable in this routine and what I'm doing now. Why do I have to change? And, and when I was a younger person, I didn't take so well to that change, right? But as I've, I've gotten older and I've gotten further into my um, career, I realized that the only way that I'll ever get better is if I change, is if I evolve too, right? Um, another thing that I, I learned along with change is that it goes for other people as well. I had, when I worked for the university, I worked with a lot of military and adult students and the, who were working towards completing their degrees. That I, I'm in the same position. I didn't finish the first time I went to college. And so I went back uh, and finished my program, but I was dealing with people on a daily basis that they were so comfortable in, in the way they had always done things and the way that everything has always been, right? Think of it like a user. The user has your application, has your website, and they're always, well, this is the way you've always done it. Why would you make a change? And, and we have to be sure that we introduce those changes because it's, it's hard to do that. It's, and, and sometimes we have to motivate ourselves. We have to motivate the people we work with. Right, so I, I was motivating adult learners who were, in some cases, older than I was at the time. Like, how do you how do you do that? How do you stoke that fire internally? Right, and something I've learned about that is that motivating adults is are, it's a lot like talking to children and motivating children. I have an 18 year old, as a matter of fact, that I'm trying to get through to graduation. A lot of motivation has to happen for that one, but. With adults, it's, it's, we're so set in our ways and we're so, this is the way I've always done it and this is the way I'm gonna to continue to do it. When you work with them in such a manner of like introducing a new software or introduce, you know, trying to get them to finish their classes for their degree, you have to light a fire underneath them, right? We all have to have that fire, that passion, that spark. But the thing that I think that we sometimes overlook is the fact that you have to stay and stoke the fire, especially when you first started, right? A fire is not going to take off if you just light it and walk away. You can't keep that passion going. You can't keep that fire underneath them to keep going if you're not there to stoke it along the way. We have to, and we have to do that for ourselves. When we realize that we need to change, we have to do that for other people. Um, Granted, sometimes it's not in our power to be the ones that stoke, but we can be voices. Uh, QAs are always the voice, the advocate for the user, the voice for the user. The user's not there to give us the feedback. So we, we listen to our testers and they're the ones that are trying to stoke that fire that, hey, let's make it better. Let's do better. You know, and we have business, our business analysts and our POs and our PMs that are stoking that fire as well. Like, hey, let's make it better. And 
you'll have your architect or, or a dev that's like, hey, we could do this better. But we just have to keep stoking that fire to make sure that we're able to be passionate enough to make that change to do what we need to do. So while I was working at the university, the online university, I made a transition from um, customer service rep into this big fancy title that, that was project coordinator for the office of the registrar, right? And basically what that meant was I was pretty much a project person for anything that the office of the registrar needed to do. And this is where I learned that, again, stoking the fire and, and change is hard, but technology can be our friend. And I know as technologists, we all, we all know that, but we know people in our lives, my husband, for instance, who are just technophobes. They're just not into technology. How's it going to help me, right? And, and sometimes we have to explain it in that sometimes the easiest answer to a solution is just using the right technology or flipping the right switch. Um, for instance, on that one is when I was working as a project coordinator, I had this little project. I always had these little projects and we had this uh, backend system called the banner. And what it was, was just a record keeping system, right? It's kind of like a CRM. It's a record keeping system, but all of these people were like, well, we want a Dean's list and we want to keep track of who all's on the Dean's list and what their GPAs are and this and that and the other. And so all of these meetings get made and it's a committee and a committee and a committee just trying to figure out how are we going to do this? We're talking to IT, everybody. And this is taking weeks to try to figure out what's going on. And I've been in the system enough and I've tinkered with it. that I started poking just to figure out what is there? There's got to be something in this system that's not this hard. It, it's a system made for universities. Surely there's something that'll pull a dean's list. So I poke around one day and I find a little box and it says dean's list. Check. <laughs> so I check mark the box. And no sooner did I do that, we realized that we have the ability to see now everybody who's made the dean's list for that term. And so what, what was going to end up being months and months of development work and, and data warehouse work and just trying to figure out how are we gonna store this? Where are we gonna put it? What are we gonna do? Came down to a simple switch. You know, and, and that's, that's part of that technology, you know, and the easiest answer. Sometimes we look at things and this is something that I, I take away and, and I'd love for other people to, to kind of realize too is that sometimes the best answer is actually the easiest. We get so drilled down into complicated answers for, for things and because we're trying to do the best that we can, right? We're trying to make everything work in the best way that we think possible. And so we think, oh, well, we need to go do this and we need to have this database and we need to have pull from this data warehouse and we need the data dictionary and we need data, 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 data. When sometimes we can do it very easily. If we can step outside of ourselves and kind of step outside of what we were doing, we can see that, oh, there is an easier answer. There is, we don't have to be quite so complicated. I think sometimes in, in technology, we think that because it's technology, it needs to be complicated. Broad strokes here. I know not everybody thinks this way, but sometimes, and sometimes, you know, we can get into the weeds and, and we really do think that a complicated a complicated problem needs a complicated solution. But really what I've learned is that sometimes it really is just the, the easiest solution is the most clean and is the best one that will work for the time. But again, sometimes it, it's changed to try to wrap your head around that that can be the answer sometimes. So the lessons I learned in this part, this early part of my life were that Humans are strange creatures. We're just weird. And that's okay because they're never going to use our application or our software the same. I mean, think about it. You don't use the same application in the same way twice, or at least I don't. Um, so we have to plan for that in some cases. Our testers have to test for that. Don't take it out on us. Don't think that we're trying to be pick on you or anything. As testers, what we're trying to do is we're trying to be that strange human. We're trying to think outside the box. What's going to happen if we click outside this modal? Are we handling it elegantly? Are we taking the system down, right? So that 
humans are weird and we have to we have to adapt to that and something else is that no isn't always the right answer there's something that at uh, rocket homes there's a whole we have this whole list of things that we live by and one of those one of my favorites is yes before no no isn't always the right answer sometimes we have to say yes okay let's try it that way and we have to we have to fail fast right try this fail fast pivot try something else right so in sales and development and testing no isn't always the right answer sometimes a tester can come up and be like this is a bug and, and an immediate reaction that we'll get is no it's not it's the way it's supposed to be what we all need to do testers included because we will <laughs> we'll come back at you sometimes like that is we need to sit back and we need to listen to each other we need to find out why why is this instead of just saying no we need to find out why and see if we can take that path to the yes because change is hard right to change our minds to change what we're doing is always hard but it's inevitable if we're going to get better and if we're going to be have better technology we've got to be able to change and something that uh that i was talking about this one here, it, it doesn't seem like I may have said it out loud, but speaking to people in their own language, this is that connection. This is that sto stoking the fire in someone else. If you can connect to someone on a level that they understand, maybe it's a book, maybe it's a movie, maybe it's a, a shared love for a certain, I don't know, Python or Java, right? A certain language, not just a language like Spanish or Java or C++, but the language of, of understanding of people. If we can make that connection to people, because we may be technologists, but we're not robots. When we make connections, we can actually go further and, and be more open to change and be able to, to work with each other better. So I'm gonna kind of go through the looking glass now. I've been, I followed the rabbit, and now I'm gonna go through the looking glass and, and start into QA. And for QA people, we typically fall, at least the people I've talked to, uh, typically fall into QA. We don't go to school for it. There's no classes for it. There's no degree programs. A lot of people that I've worked with um, have computer science degrees and ended up being a tester. Um, other people that I've worked with are completely outside of technology and have come in. Um, I've seen developers become testers. I've seen testers become developers. We just don't have a singular path. Um, nobody that I've talked to, and even myself, I didn't grow up saying, oh, I want to be a tester and test software when I grow up. You know, I, I, I wanted to be an architect. I wanted to be a veterinarian. I wanted to be a music teacher. I wanted to be Mr. Holland, right? But there were other things that came into play. There was other things that, that happened. What happened is somebody usually kind of like nudges us into the right direction, that place where we should be. And usually because they see that our personality fits into technology, maybe we're really good with the systems or maybe we just have a certain thing inside of us that is like, you're gonna be better suited over here in technology. And they kind of like gently push us that direction. Because like I said, a lot of us didn't even know what we wanted to be when we grew up. Okay, well, I didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up. Um, so I just kind of traversed along, and like I said, a wide, just winding path, you know? But none of those places were where I was supposed to be. Um, I had a boss, that, that registrar boss that I was talking about, he's the one that pushed me into IT. He saw that I, I could handle technology and that I could do all this. And so there was a position that came open in IT for a BA, which at the time I didn't know what a BA was, business analyst, what, what do they even do, right? But I applied for it anyway. And they were gracious enough to interview me, but they decided that they were gonna go with somebody that had experience as a BA. Um, but I got lucky because they thought that by when they were talking to me that I had this mindset, like I had this understanding of technology and then thought, why don't you, why don't you come be a QA? And I was like, sure. What's that? <laughs> I had no idea what a QA was, but they were willing to teach me. They were willing to take me in and show me what this all was. 
and a lot of it had to do with the curiosity that I have about things. It's, it's, I have a curiosity about what happens when, right? When I go to this website and I click this button, what's going to happen? If you put a button in front of me and label it, do not push, I have a really hard time not pushing that button. Sometimes I push it anyway. Um, but it's always this curiosity. And, and sometimes if, if QA testers can look back and think about it, there's always been a curiosity on how the world works, on how the universe works, on how a cassette tape radio works to the point where you take all the screws out and completely take it apart and lay it across the floor just to see what the different gears do, just to see what the different things will do, right? I, I mean, that's what I did. And I always had this like, we're the ones that always ask why or how come, or we just constantly have this, what happens when, right? There's always this little tickle in the back of our heads. We never outgrew it. Some people did. Some people just, they're like, okay, well, it is what it is. But some of us never outgrew that portion of wanting to know how things work or that childish thing of pushing every button we can just to see what happens. These are all things that, that, that I brought with me into QA that made me kind of really suited for this position right? But I didn't know how to do anything. There, there weren't any classes. People had to teach me. And I got pushed into it, really. I, you know, somebody that knows us better will push us into it. And sometimes we thought we knew what we wanted to be, but we, we really, really didn't. And that's why those people that know us better or know, can see something about us, that's why they're great. And why I'm grateful to them for just pushing me in that direction. Because my curiosity was there that spark of something was there and they they knew that if they pushed me in the right direction they'd stoke that fire so we're going to go down the yellow brick road now i've got a couple of minutes so just bear with me <laughs> um i i wandered down the yellow brick road of qa and, and i learned all about waterfall that was terrifying i mean three inch thick binders full of artifacts of how something was supposed to be and how it was supposed to work and and screenshots and pictures and devs just throwing the work at us and no one telling us that, well, on page 45, this screen has changed and it's not gonna look like that until we hit that page, right? And it was, it was a daunting, scary process. It wasn't something that um, was easy to take on even to start, but I got lucky with that one because I got to help transition and, and do that change into agile. Change is easier when you realize it's gonna make the world better, <laughs> make your work better, right? So I got to go to, uh, as, a, as a QA for the, the university, I got to go to a conference on agile and what it means and, and how to do it. And we got, to, we got to come back with all that information. And I realized that using agile actually was going to make my life a little bit easier. I got to have shorter sprints, shorter turnaround time. I got to test faster and I loved it. But I learned that when you get started, you have no idea what you don't know until you realize you don't know it, <laughs> right? And what, what showed me that was when I went on to my next job, which was called a quality information coordinator. And I didn't know that it wasn't a quality job. This is early in my career, so I didn't realize that quality for every one, when you go out there on, on the search boards and you try to find a quality job, quality doesn't mean the same thing. You have to be very specific, right? Um, quality information coordinator, I basically made uh, certificates for wire rope factories on how tough the wire ropes were and how much it took until they would break. So, Needless to say, that quality job didn't last long because that wasn't what I was looking for. I learned at that job, though, that the important things are that you can't rely on the written word to get your point across. You got to get up. You got to go talk to these people because it's faster and it builds relationships. And, and you lose a lot when you don't communicate face to face. I've done so many quality things, though, like API, leading quality test. Um, database validations, there, there's just no, there's no, no straight path, right? 
it, you just never know where you're going to go with it. Um, I think I'm just about at time. So I'll just kind of go through this. Um, waterfall is terrifying, but starting agile and changing is too, right? And when we get into things, we have to realize that sometimes the words we use don't mean the same thing to everyone. Quality can be different depending on healthcare, um, wire ropes, or software. But what's great about us, you know, what's great about our, our lives is that we've never had one straight path. We've been able to kind of meander around to find what best suits us. So what it all means is that everything we've ever done affects how we test. What we learned, what we experienced, what we do, what we failed at, it all leads us to how we test and how we test better. And that means that no two testers will ever be the same because they all bring different experiences. And there's not one style to testing. I mean, we have debates in the testing community on, the, on what nomenclature is correct. QA, quality analyst, quality advocate, tester. No two people ever agree on that and what we do. But that doesn't mean we can't have standards. We put test plans into place. We use our influence and our knowledge of, of our experiences and of what we know of design and requirements gathering and we put it into our tests. And we use tools and frameworks that set a baseline for our expectations of our quality teams. And you know, we use tools like test management uh, software and automated uh, software or writing automated tests in code. But no matter what rabbit we chased, how many stops along the way, we all ended up at our fairy tale ending. I did. I got pushed into this, but I found Oz. And I'm super, super happy to be there. And I, I kind of want just everyone to know that it doesn't matter what your path looked like. It doesn't matter how you got here. You're supposed to be here. And we're glad that you are. Sorry, I went a little bit over. Um, I want to thank you guys. There's my contact information. Um, yes, don't rely on the written word from the um, chat here. If you can have a conversation with someone, you can get your point across and you can be better understood and they can better understand you. It's it, one of my favorite things that I learned from that job was just get up and walk over to someone or have a Zoom call and see them face to face and get the words out. 